Good morning. Good morning. If you're a guest with us, I'm Brandon Bench, lead pastor here at Judson Road. And thankful for everyone being here or joining us online, wherever you may be at right now. Um, so just jumping right in, I will admit to you uh, that this is, uh, this is probably the, the most challenging sermon for this series for me to preach. Um, and it's not because we were stolen, an hour of sleep was stolen from us last night. It's not because of that. Although we did get an hour of sleep stolen from us. Anybody feeling it right now? Right? Like, it's like, whew. hey, by the way, good job on making it, though. You know? <laughs> right? Hey, go ahead. You can give yourself a hand. Um, no, the, the, the real reason why this is, this is the most challenging uh, sermon in this series, just cut, cut into it, uh, it's, it's on loss. Okay? So we, we're in this series, Down to Earth. We've been looking at Jesus who came down to earth. He lived a down-to-earth life like you and I do. We, we are down to earth. We experience things. We experience emotions. Jesus experienced those same things that we experience. And, uh, and today we're going to hit on loss. Now, the reason that this is challenging for me to preach on is not necessarily because of the loss that I have experienced in my life, although I have experienced loss. Okay, uh, many of us know, but if you don't, in 2013, my older brother, he was diagnosed, well, actually it was 2012, uh, he was diagnosed with uterine sarcoma cancer, which is a cancer, he was 34 whenever he was diagnosed. It's a cancer typically found in like teenage boys, young teenage boys or girls, um, but it was uterine sarcoma cancer, it was in the, in the spinal cord, and, uh, and he battled, they actually gave him two months, they, they said he had about two months to live. Um, and then he, he lived for about 16 months. He passed away in May of 2013. So I've had the experience of, of, of watching my brother fight through cancer and then passing away. Um, I lost loved ones. I've lost grandparents. I've lost uh, aunts and uncles and actually nieces and, and nephews. Um, saying that, I have experienced loss in my life, but that's not the challenging part of preaching on loss today for me. It's because... I still can't relate with everyone because I know that there's loss in this room that is different than even what I have experienced. The loss of a spouse, uh, the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, and it's, it's not easy, and it hurts, and it's painful, but it is real, and it is life. And even though it's challenging, it is something that every now and then we do need to process together. And, and here's the hope that we do have, even in our loss. Because I look around the room and I know there's people going through this season of loss right now. E even when we are in this season, one thing that we can be encouraged by, and that's what we're going to see this morning, is that we have a Savior. We have a Lord. We have a King of Kings and Lord of Lords who has also experienced loss and pain and hurt, and he even wept at the loss of a good friend. So we have a Savior who can relate to the pain that we go through when we experience loss. So this morning, we're going to be looking at a story. It's, a, it's the story of Lazarus. It's actually him both dying and coming back to life through the power of Jesus. So we're going to look at this story. John chapter 11 is where we're going to be at. And we're going to read quite a bit of this story. Uh, oftentimes what I would do is I would, you know, skip a lot of parts or skip. I, I, I just want us to read the whole story to get the whole context of what's going on. So it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of reading today. Uh, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to, it's going to make sense at the end. But I just want us to read through this. Uh, the first part, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 27. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. So let me just, let me just throw this out. He, was, he, he didn't have the flu. He was on his deathbed. Okay, so that's where we are on this. Like he's, he's sick, sick. All right, so not much time is left, okay? So he was, he was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and, his, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you what? Love 
The one you love is sick. So he has a relationship. He has a relationship with Mary and Martha and obviously Lazarus, right? So verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you were going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. Verse 10, It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. They actually thought that Jesus was going to be going right now to his death. That's what they were talking about there. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for how many days? Four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So by the way, Mary staying at home, that would have been the customary thing to do. I've I've taught this before, but uh, it was actually, it would have been weird. It would have been abnormal to leave the house, Jesus should have went into the house to comfort Mary and Martha. So the fact that Martha goes and, and, and leaves the house, uh, she has an agenda is why she does this. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. By the way, thanks for coming. Verse 22, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ. That means the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. All right, a lot to unpack. So Jesus received a message that Lazarus was sick. And I already explained, we're talking sick, sick. We're talking deathbed sickness, right? They didn't have a hospital just to take him. They, did, they were trying to help him. They were trying to get him uh, feeling better and, and, and bring him back to health because they knew that Jesus could do something. They were waiting for Jesus to get there. They were waiting for Jesus to come. But then we have this weird response from Jesus. We have this awkward response, and if we look at it, we can see that it it might not completely make sense right away. This is not the sickness that leads to death, but rather it's a sickness that will glorify my Father, and so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. So wait a minute. Jesus is saying there's a sickness that's going to be used to glorify who? The Father, God, and the Son. Wait a minute. God is going to use someone's sickness, ultimately someone's death, someone's pain, someone's suffering. I mean, we got to remember Mary and Martha, they watched their brother take his last breath. And, and, And hear me, that hurts. Anybody? That, that's painful. And, and it's not something that's actually, I was talking to somebody about this a few weeks ago, that death is not natural. We are supposed to live, so when we see death happen, it's unnatural and it hurts and it's painful. And Jesus is saying, 
this will not end in death, but it's going to bring glory to my Father. And there has to be some confusion there. Now, 2,000 years removed, we know, the many of us know the end of the story. If you don't, I'll give you a clue. Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead. He's going to come back to life, right? So we know that Mary and Martha didn't. The disciples didn't. The Jews didn't. Mary and Martha were sitting there like, hey, if Jesus would just get here, if Jesus would just, would just get here. They know that Jesus can do something. Jesus, we need you to come. And he waited two days before he started going there. He heard the news. I mean, maybe that's why Martha ran out and said, hey, Jesus, I love you, but what are you doing? And, and for us, I don't, I don't know, we, we don't have physical Jesus in the flesh like they did, right? For us, I don't think we're going to say, Jesus, why didn't you show up? But I do think we do question, Jesus, why is it happening to me? Why is it happening to her? Why is it happening to him? Jesus, why would you allow this? Why wouldn't you change it? I mean, and I don't remember exactly when this was. This was, um, it was either right after Alan, my brother, had passed. Uh, we were getting ready for the funeral, and we were at, the, at Kim, Kim and Alan's house. Uh, so whenever my brother passed, he left behind wife Kim and my, and my three nephews, uh, Nolan, Justin, and Michael. And, um, and we were there getting ready for the funeral. It might have been after the funeral. I don't know exactly what it was. Uh, but Kim, Kim is a great, great sister, great sister-in-law. Um, she goes, hey, hey, Justin. Justin, my middle nephew, was there. And she goes, hey, Justin, why don't you ask your uh, uncle, Pastor Brandon, that really hard question that you asked me the other day? And I'm like, gee, thanks, Kim. Like, right? Like, and I was like, hey, what, what's up, bud? So Justin looks at me, and I don't even remember how old he was, but he was pretty young. And he looks at me, and he goes, well, well, I got a friend who, who has a daddy who got cancer, and, and he didn't die. Why did my daddy die? And sometimes I think that's our question. Why did it happen to, to my family? Why did it happen to my mom? Why did it happen to my dad? Why did it happen to my kid? Why did it happen to my spouse? Why did the tragedy happen to a good person and not a scumbag? Let's be real. Anybody? You know what my answer is? I don't know. I don't know. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that in this very room, I know that, that some of us have gone through it and we're going through it. And I'm sorry that you're going through it. And I don't have the answers. We don't have the answers. But, but let me try to encourage you. Don't hold it against God. Because he is not a God of death and pain, and suffering, and hurt. He is not a God of, of taking away. He is a God of, of saving. And, and, and I've heard this before. I've heard when people are going through loss, sometimes the, in, in, in emotions, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing all this, like we're going to go through emotions. We're going to go through seasons. We're going to go through ups and downs. We're going to go through pain. And, and that's part of it. We'll talk about that uh, here in a few minutes. Um, but I, I've heard that that when some have gone through loss, they, they feel like they're, they're being rejected or hurt by God. And hear me on this. God is not a God who rejects and hurts us. He is a God who actually feels the hurt that we feel. And he is a God who is sad when we are sad. He hasn't rejected us. He has accepted us, and he relates with us. So when we hurt and we are sad, he too stands beside us and hurts with you and is sad with you because Jesus went through it as well. Jesus felt the hurt. Jesus felt the pain. Verse 32 when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he, what? Loved him. You see, Jesus gets it. Jesus hurt too. Jesus had pain. Jesus even had pain. And what's interesting about that pain is Jesus had that pain. Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Jesus felt it. Even though he knew what he was about to do, which was bring Lazarus back to life, he could have done it where he didn't feel the pain or, or cried or wept. He could have skipped all that and did what? Poof, come back. Am I, am I wrong? He was going to do it anyways, but what did he do? He experienced the pain and the loss that we, too, experience. He understands. He can relate. He has experienced sadness because of loss, the sadness that creates painful tears. He can relate. And friends, we are not hurt and rejected by God because we have a Savior. We have a Lord that hurts with us. And that's sad with you. He understands. But he also understands what is to come. He also understands the end of the story. Verses 38 through 45. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said that this, this for the, I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Ever been to a funeral like that? Lazarus, come out, the dead man. You notice John's emphasizing that? He was dead for how many days? This wasn't like somebody quit breathing for 10 minutes or an hour. Lazarus was gone. He was dead, and John is making that point again. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said, said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. Other translations say that they believed in him. I would too at that point. Anybody? Like, like Jesus knew what was coming, but he still felt the pain of loss. Jesus knew what was coming, but he still felt the pain of separation from, from a loved friend that he had. He knew what was coming, but he still went through it. And, and then he said, and you remember what he said to Martha? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's what Jesus was showing. In that moment, death is not the end. Death is not the end. Where there is death, when there's belief in Christ, there is eternal life that doesn't end. Death is not the end even though it hurts. Can you imagine that? I mean, 
I just, I, I want us to picture you're, you're a Jew. Or, or you're, you're there, right? First century. You're at the cave, right? Jesus comes and, and like he's saying, hey, let's open, open, take that stone away. And everybody's like, what are you doing? Right? Like, like now they know there's something special about this Jesus. They've heard about the miraculous signs. They've heard about the miracles. They know that he can do something. But come on, if you start seeing at a funeral that somebody's yelling at somebody that's in the casket, get up. What are you going to think? You're going to think, shut up. Anybody? Like, come on. It's just, I've, I've never seen that. And those people hadn't either. So they removed the stone and Jesus in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. What would you have thought right then? Like, how much wine did he have? Like, well, that party was like two years ago at that point, but it doesn't even matter, right? Like, like, what is he doing? And then you saw the dead man walking. You saw the dead man coming out. You saw him come back, but you knew he was, for four days, he was gone. And Jesus would look at you and say, see, death isn't the end. It's only the beginning. And if our hope, if our hope and our life is in Christ, even though there will be pain, we can have a hope that life will one day never end. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So let me break this, let me break this down a little bit more um, and look at this from two different perspectives. Um, as a pastor, I, I, do, I do funerals. Um, I pastor people. Um, I'm with families. My family, a lot of times, is with families who are grieving and has gone through loss, and it's just it's just part of um, uh, of what I do. And we we see loss closely a, a lot with different people, right? And and as a as a pastor, I do funerals, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I do funerals sometimes for people who haven't given their life to Christ. They they haven't said, I'm. I, I follow Jesus. They haven't committed. They're, they would say they're not a Christian or they're not a disciple, whatever term you want to use. But then I do, I do funerals for people, for families who they're lost. The, the one that, that died is a follower of Jesus, has given their life to Christ, has pursued after Jesus, was sold out for Jesus. I'm going to be real honest with you, real honest with you. That one is a lot easier to do. This one over here, that's hard to do, Okay. Um, actually, just let me just be blunt with you. There's a T-shirt out there. I'll buy it for you if you want. If you want me to, there's a T-shirt out there. It says, "Don't don't make your pastor lie at your funeral." You like that, right? I'm just help us out, right? We're just gonna say it, right? I'm just gonna be real with you. The non-Christian funeral that's tough. The Christian funeral, it's tough, but there's a hope involved. Okay, so let me. Let me balance this for us. Um, if, if you've experienced loss, and deep down you're like, yeah, I mean, they believed in a higher power. I, the fruit wasn't quite there. I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had a widow ask, ask me, like, hey, we obviously know that he wasn't following Christ. What do you think? And I looked at, at that young lady and I said, and this was what, five years, four years ago, I said, hear me, God's grace is bigger than what you will ever know. And we're not the judge. God's grace is bigger and more powerful than you or I will ever know. Whenever I was in, whenever I first started Bible college, I was a freshman. It was 2007. I was I was 23. So because I was a little bit older and I was a freshman in Bible college, I knew everything. Okay, so 
So me, I think I've shared this before. I probably shared this before, but but I'm sure not everybody's heard this. But, uh, me and a, and a buddy of mine, Josh Bennett, we were in one of our theology classes, and we would we would work out at the Y, which is right down the road from the Christian College, and we would work out at the Y, and um, and an individual that was there, this gentleman that was there, overheard our conversation, and he comes over to us, and he's like, "Hey, hey." Um, you, you all go to that Bible college? And we're like, yes, yes, we do. So, so you all actually believe all that stuff in the Bible? And I'm like, why, yes, we do. Like, that's why we're going to the Bible college, right? Like, and, and, and he, goes, he goes, well, let me ask you something. So he had an agenda, by the way, right? And remember, I was a 23-year-old freshman in Bible college, and I knew everything, right? So he goes, he goes let me ask you something. If, if you're a dad and you go to heaven and your son didn't commit his life to Jesus, and your son goes to hell, how is that heaven for you? And I said, well, I have all the answers. Well, obviously in heaven, you won't remember your son if that would make you sad. Obviously in heaven, you wouldn't remember your son because God would never allow pain or suffering or tears or any of that. And he goes, oh, so you're an idiot in heaven? And I said, no, you're not an idiot. Oh, so God just, uh, he empties your mind of the, the most important relationships that you've ever had? And then you know what I did? I shut my mouth. That's what I should have done the first time. Nikki, you should have been there. You could have told me, right? <laughs> like, I, I said, you know what? Give me your number. I, I don't know. So I went to a professor of mine, John Rawls. He was my speech professor. Um... And John Rawls, I went to him, and I gave him the scenario. And I said, I said, what do I do with that? I got this guy's number. He's asking questions. Um, wh what do I do with that? And he goes, okay, well, if you're the father and your son didn't commit to Christ, but you're in heaven, then you obviously did commit to Christ. And you did commit to his lordship. And you did commit and submit that God is sovereign. And every decision that God makes is just and right and pure he cannot do wrong so you've obviously being in heaven have submitted to that authority of god no matter what the decision is but hear me on this that god who is just is also merciful and that god who is just is also a God of grace. And never forget, God's grace is bigger than you will ever know. And for the one who has lost a Christian, said goodbye to a follower of Jesus. Like I said, funerals aren't easy. Like going through loss, it's not easy. Um, but Paul says that that because of the hope that we have or because of the, the hope that, that the one who passed away had in Christ, in Jesus, Paul says we grieve, but we grieve differently. We grieve with a hope that one day we will be reunited with our loved one. We grieve with a hope that is greater than what we are going through. But hear me on this. You still grieve. And that's okay. You should. And that's okay. It's okay to feel the hurt. It's okay to ask the questions. I tell people, it's okay to yell at God. He's a big God. He can handle it. And it's going to be roller coasters of seasons, ups and downs and all arounds, and you're not going to know. And it's sometimes you're going to be in the middle of the grocery store, and you're just going to start crying. Anybody? And it's going to happen, and that's okay because you grieve. And my sister-in-law, Kim, she would say she'd be in the middle of the grocery store and just out of nowhere burst into tears. Just burst into tears. And, and, and that's, hear me, you're going to grieve. But you're going to grieve with a hope that you will be reunited with your loved one. You grieve with a hope that one day you'll stand right there with them, praising God together. 
You grieve with a hope that one day you'll be back and holding hands with them. Right? And so, so I spoke at my, my grandfather's uh, funeral. Um, I guess this was 2011, 2012. Glenna and I were dating. I don't even think we were engaged at the time, but I spoke at Grandpa Bench's funeral. I love Grandpa Bench. Christian man, very stubborn man. Oh, oh Lord, very stubborn man. Um, I hope my dad hears me on this because he knows too, right? Grandpa's pretty stubborn, but he was stubborn for Jesus is how he sold it at the funeral, right? Like he was stubborn for Jesus. Uh, but I remember at the end of the funeral, or at the end of the message that I gave, um, I brought up the, the, the song Amazing Grace. It's one of my favorite songs is Amazing Grace. And there's, there's a line in it that I just absolutely love. Uh, maybe some of you already know where I'm going. When we've been there 10,000 years, right, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing your praise than when we first begun. And, and what I did at, at my grandfather's message and whenever I was speaking, what I did is I, 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 I changed it just a little bit. Let me just encourage you with this. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we no less days to sing your praise with my grandpa, with my brother, with my grandma, with your loved one, than when we first begun. And that only is possible because of what Jesus Christ has done. And it's the hope that we can hold on to in the hardest times that death is not the end. It's only the beginning. Hold on to the hope that Jesus gives. Let me pray for you. Lord, this is hard. This hurts. It's not easy. If we live long enough, we experience loss, and it's not the way that, that you've expressed it. It's not the way that, that you have desired or designed this world to be with sickness and disease and hurt and pain. That's not the way that you originally designed it, Father. Lord, Lord, we ask that in times of pain, times of hurt, that you show us how we lean upon your spirit and we lean upon your comfort and we hold on to the greatest hope that we have in you, eternal life that will never end. Father, give us that hope. Let it, let it stir our lives. Let it give us comfort at the times that we need comfort. Lord, we love you. We praise you. It's in your name.